You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Greetings and welcome to the show Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke. And just as a reminder, you are listening to Words on Film on BostonFreeRadio.com, watching Words on Film and listening to it, presumably, on some rural community access television or some community access TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. To them, I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live. Today, on my own personal page, unfortunately not on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page because of technical difficulties, but either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. So, last Sunday was the Oscars, and the day before that was the Razzies. So I'm going to be dedicating this show to the Oscar winners, the Razzie winners, and basically take, giving my take on what deserved to win, what should have won, you know the deal. But first, I'm going to begin my show with my segment, What's Topping the Box Office? This is a recap of the top ten highest box office grocers of this past weekend. <clears throat> so it's not too much of a surprise to me that Black Panther is still number one at the box office. It may be knocked out next week by a wrinkle in time, but we'll have to see. But I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't. But this week, it took in a cool $66.3 million. Now, I'm just going to tell you right off the bat... Here in the States and around the world, Black Panther is a certified hit. But here are the numbers. Against a budget of $200 million, Black Panther has grossed $501.7 million in just the United States alone. Around the world, it has made $899.9 million as of press time. That is incredibly impressive. The number two movie of the week is also the highest grossing debut movie of the week and didn't even come close to pulling in Black Panther's numbers even in its third week. The movie is Red Sparrow, starring Jennifer Lawrence, which which took in $16.9 million domestically against a budget of $69 million. So it's not even close to a hit, but it's in a good position, so it may recoup its budget. Around the world's a little bit more promising, having grossed $43.5 million, but again, still not a hit yet. Death Wish is the other debut movie of the week, the other big one that is. It grossed $13 million this past weekend in the United States, putting it at number three at the box office, against a budget of $30 million. And I don't have the international numbers for you, but Death Wish, like Red Sparrow, is not a hit, but given its relatively low budget, it could recoup its budget back in maybe the next two or three weeks. We'll have to see. Game Night debuted at number two last week. This weekend, it dropped to number four, having grossed $10.4 million. Against a budget of $37 million, slightly more than Death Wish, surprisingly enough, Game Night has so far grossed $33.2 million here in the States and $49.5 million worldwide, making it not a hit yet here in the States, but very close to becoming one. But around the world, it is already a tentative hit. Peter Rabbit is number five of the box office this weekend, sliding from number three last week, having grossed $10 million even this past weekend in the United States. Against a budget of $50 million, that is five zero million million, Peter Rabbit has so far grossed in the United States $84.1 million, which is, a, which is a great number, and around the world it has grossed $102 million. So Peter Rabbit is not pulling in the same kind of money that either Paddington movie is made, but here in the States is a tentative hit. Around the world, it has eked its way to becoming a certified hit. Annihilation is a movie that opened around actually the same weekend as Game Night, but man, this movie is struggling uh, despite good reviews. This weekend, it pulled in $5.6 million and fell from number fell to number six from number four last week. Against a budget of $55 million, Annihilation is so far in the United States grossed $20.6 million. I don't have the international numbers for you for Annihilation, but I can tell you that it is not a hit here in the States and it's not looking good for this movie, which is unfortunate. That's another movie that I haven't seen yet. Or actually, I have seen it. I just haven't reviewed it on this show yet. But next week when I get back to my regular reviews, I'm definitely going to be reviewing this movie because it is strange, but it's appealing. And I, I think that'll, that'll give you enough of a preview of what I think of the movie. 
Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle, in its 11th week in release, is number 7 at the box office, sliding from number 6 last week. So Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle, is in its descent right now, but here in the States, it only made $4.4 million in the U.S., but... Against a budget of 90 to $110 million, Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle has so far grossed $393.1 million here in the States, which is incredible, and it's topped only by Black Panther in the top 10 right now. And around the world, it has so far grossed $930 million. So it goes without saying that Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Took a little bit longer to get to the certified level, more so than Black Panther, but Considering it's hung in there for nearly three months, great job to Jumanji. Welcome to the jungle. Fifty Shades Freed, not my favorite movie. In fact, the worst movie I've seen so far this calendar year. It's number eight of the box office, having slid from number five last week, and lo and behold, this movie is actually a hit. I'll explain how. It grossed $3.4 million this past weekend, but against a budget of $55 million, Fifty Shades Free has so far grossed $95.7 million here in the States, and around the world, God damn it, it has grossed $340 $6.2 million, which means a couple of things. It is a tentative hit here in the States. It could eke its way to being a certified hit, but it's going to take a while to get there. But around the world, it is already certified, so I guess some people like this movie. I don't see how, but that's a fact. The Greatest Showman, which is also making its descent, is number nine of the box office, sliding slightly from number eight last week, having grossed $2.7 million at the box office last weekend. Against a budget of $84 million, The Greatest Showman has so far grossed $164.6 million here in the States and $376.1 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit, very close to being a certified hit here in the States. Around the world, it is most certainly certified. And finally, number 10, the movie Every Day only grossed $1.5 million at the U.S. box office, but against a budget of $4.9 million, it has grossed a total of $5.2 million. So even though we won't see it in the top 10 next week, it is already a tentative hit here in the States, and I don't have the international numbers for you, so I can't tell you how it's doing internationally. It only takes a minute to find out if you may have prediabetes. And you can do it at doihaveprediabetes.org. Uh, you're probably not going to, are you? Kids are listening to the radio. You're busy, which is great because busy people can't get prediabetes. Oh my, I read that wrong. <laughs> they can. Should have worn my glasses. So visit doihaveprediabetes.org and take a short test because prediabetes can be reversed. Brought to you by the Ad Council and its prediabetes awareness partners. Hi, I'm Pierce. And I'm Calvin. And are you tired of fake news? Yes. So tired. Sorry, were you asking me? I was just in general. Oh, well, I, yeah, yeah. I am I can only speak for me. I'm really tired of so, fake news. Yeah, me too. So, good thing is we run a oh, that's right. radio we, show. Right, we have a radio show where we uh, try to debunk fake news. We try to cut through all the all the oh, crap. Crap. Yeah. Because there's a lot of it. Uh-huh. And we're trying to bring you f straight facts. Straight facts. Oh, it's called Fact Up. It's our show's called Fact Up. It's not called Straight Facts. No. The show is called Fact Up. And it's Mondays at 2 p.m. and it's an hour long. Yeah, only on BFR. <coughs> Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and this is a show where I usually give you my reviews of films, but considering that Oscar season just ended, I might as well get into the Oscar winners, who I thought should have won, who deserved to win, and so on. And so, first, before I get into my recap of the winners, I might as well tell you how the show was. And honestly, I think last year's show was a little bit better, but this year's show certainly had its high moments. First of all, Jimmy Kimmel, I thought, was an excellent host. He did a great job. His material was very well written. He delivered it very well. Although, one thing I was disappointed about was the fact that I didn't get to see any mean tweet segments. And I really wanted to see that, like, last year. But then again, the celebrity mean tweet segments is one of those segments that's only about two to three minutes long. And no matter... <sighs> How many times I've seen it, it just never seems long enough. 
You know, it, it, it always seems way too short. But with that said, I thought dear Jimmy Kimmel did a great job. The only really awkward part of his um, hosting was when he brought a bunch of celebrities, including Gal Gadot and Lupita Nyong'o, Army Hammer, and a few others, to a screening that uh, of of people seeing the the movie A Wrinkle in Time. They were they were seeing a sneak preview of it, and he brought in these celebrities to hand out candy. And I, I thought it didn't work the same way it did last year, where there was a a, a group on getting a tour of Hollywood and then they are brought into the Kodak Theater, much to their surprise, not knowing that they'd meet so many celebrities. So I thought that get, th- that setup worked better last year than, than the one did this year, especially with the the, the hot dog shaped cannons. I mean, it's such a small screening room. I, I don't know how that could have worked, but in any event, it was, it was not a bad show. And I think probably the biggest highlights of the show were the fact that There were so many female nominees and winners, not to mention presenters, who really stole the show and made it their own. And I'm going to get into a little bit of that in a bit. But first, let me get into some of the nominees and the winners. And I do have to say, for every category that wasn't best picture, in other words, ones that were awarding... A, a movie a, as opposed to any kind of um, artistic or, or technical achievements. I, I tended to get every one of those categories wrong except Best Animated Feature. So let me get into the shorts first. So the nominees for Best Documentary Short Subject are, very quickly, Edith and Eddie, Heaven is a Traffic Jam on the 405, Heroin, Knife Skills, and Traffic Stop. Now, I think I'm joined with all my other film critics or fellow film critics in that we were not predicting the winner would be Heaven is a Traffic Jam on the 405. A lot of people, not me, were predicting that the documentary Heroin about the heroin epidemic in West Virginia was going to win. I personally predicted that Traffic Stop was going to win. And and maybe maybe I wasn't predicting, but I was making a very educated guess. Particularly because I still think think that Traffic Stop was the best in the documentary short subjects. And Heaven is a Traffic Jam on the 405, of course, you're dealing with the best of the best of the best, but I still don't see how that one was the better one amongst the other shorts. But regardless, that's how it turned out. And now on to best short subject live, or rather best live action film short subject. And I'm just bringing it up on my... Here it is. Okay, the nominees were DeKalb Elementary, The Eleven O'Clock, My Nephew Emmett, The Silent Child, and Watu Rote slash All of Us. So the film I thought should have been the winner was DeKalb Elementary, but I also said last week when I was doing my predictions that The Silent Child might upset DeKalb Elementary. And sure enough, The Silent Child was the one that won. And I, I actually am not disappointed by this. I'll tell you what, what was the category that disappointed me the most. But live action short film was not it. If anything, one thing I said about The Silent Child, which I totally meant as a compliment, is that this is a film that I wished wasn't short. In other words, if this was expanded into a film that was an hour and a half to two hours, I would watch it and I would be captivated by it. And The Silent Child certainly was the come from behind winner, but I love that film. It certainly holds a special place in my heart. But unfortunately, it means that I'm not perfect at predicting the winners. So, on to animated short film. The nominees were Dear Basketball, Garden Party, Lou, Negative Space, and Revolting Rhymes. So, the winner of this category, I'm really mad at. Because, yeah, it was a very good short, but it wasn't as good as Garden Party. The winner of this category was Dear Basketball, which was written by and narrated by Kobe Bryant. And I do have to say that I think 
the L.A. Laker bias in Hollywood was the reason this film won. Uh, or at least I'm speculating. And I'm a little ticked off, not only because I'm not a fan of the L.A. Lakers. I mean, I'm all about... Uh, I'm all about the Celtics. But in, in any event, I, I also have to say that if this were written and narrated by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, I would have been more into it than ha- having Kobe Bryant narrate it because Kobe Bryant, yes, he's a great basketball player. He's one of the best. I think he's rivaled only by LeBron James and Michael Jordan. But one thing that's really irritated me about Kobe Bryant is how smug he usually is. Having said that, Dear Basketball was a film which he which he which he narrated that where he really showed a passion for basketball, but even still, and, and leaving smugness by the door. But in any event, that was the winner. I still think Garden Party was the best animated short film, but regardless, those are the winners of the short film category. And now onto another category that I usually get wrong, which is best documentary feature. That is full-length documentary. And I will get to that momentarily. When I was little, I didn't talk for a long time. I was sensitive to lights and sounds, so I built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in. Sometimes I do the same things over and over, until one day I found out I had all this. My family got me help. Slowly, I learned how to live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. By a long year announcing a new radio program, let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society, race is a topic that affects us all. And yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering in the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Film Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and this is my annual Oscar recap show. So now onto a category I always get wrong, mainly because I've only seen usually one or two of the documentary features, and that is Best Documentary Feature Length. The nominees were Abacus, Small Enough to Jail, Faces, Places, Icarus, Last Men in Aleppo, and Strong Island. So full disclosure, I've only seen one of these, and it was Abacus Small Enough to Jail, which was directed by Stephen James, who directed Hoop Dreams, and probably one of my favorite documentaries of all time, Roger Ebert, Life Itself. So the winner of this category was actually Icarus, which was a documentary about the Russia doping scandal. And even though I have not seen Icarus, and I'm going to since it's on Netflix, and I recommend that you do as well. I am glad that there's a movie out there that really sticks it to Russia and their cheating ways. But <laughs> but of the five documentaries, I've only seen one. I'm going to see two very soon. And a lot of people are very surprised when I tell them that I haven't seen a certain Netflix original. You know, they say, hey, it's on Netflix. You can stream it anytime. I say, I get that. But I also have other things to do in my time. I don't just sit around my house watching movies. I go out to theaters and watch movies as well. (laughs) So on to actually animated feature film. Now, there were two films in this category that really should not have been nominated. But I'm just going to read to you the nominees. The nominees were The Boss Baby, The Breadwinner, Coco, Ferdinand, 
and Loving Vincent. Now, this one I got right. The winner is Coco. And it is, I could have potentially been upset by Loving Vincent, but Coco was the winner, and I think it was the deserved winner. Now going into original song. And I do have to say this about the Oscars as well. The musical performances of all five musical numbers were phenomenal. From uh, Mighty River, sung by Mary J. Blige, to Mystery of Love, sung by Sufjan Stevens, and probably The Greatest Showman, the, the song from there, This Is Me, sung by the, the woman in the movie who has the beard, although surprisingly she comes out and in, in the Oscar ceremony and she doesn't have a beard. But either way, she brought in a great performance there, and if you'll excuse me, I'm going to find out her name rather than calling her the woman from This Is Me or the bearded lady from This Is Me. Uh, but she sang the song herself in the movie and, of course, on stage. It was Kayla Settle, K-E-A-L-A. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that. So four out of the five original song performances at the Oscars were great. And I think that the Oscars are finally getting the message in that it's not just a show where awards are handed out. It's also where people need to be entertained, particularly by in the song category. And I thought that there was a... a all, all the songs were performed really well, but there was also good space between songs. In, a, in other words, it was, it was pretty well paced as well. So, Remember Me, as it was performed at the Oscars, wasn't the best performance, but if you actually see the, mo see the movie and see the song put in the context of the movie, I thought Remember Me by Coco won, uh, or deserved to win. It, it definitely won, but I also thought it deserved to win. So, so the other category that I always get wrong, and the main reason I get it wrong is because I usually haven't seen all the films, is the best foreign language film category. And the nominees were A Fantastic Woman, The Insult, Loveless, On Body and Soul, and The Square. And interestingly enough, The Square was filmed in Sweden, but it actually wasn't a foreign language film. Most of it was in English. So it is a foreign film, but not a foreign language film. But regardless, my guess for who would win that category was going to be The Insult. But it turns out a fantastic woman actually won. I'm not disappointed. I'm disappointed that I, that I didn't guess correctly. But at the same time, I... I haven't seen it. Can't tell whether it's better than The Insult or worse, but A Fantastic Woman is a, is a film that is out in a the theater near me, and I will see it. Maybe I'll review it for next week's show. Maybe I won't, but either way, it is on my movie bucket list. So there were other categories that were more uh, science-related, and... While I was disappointed that Dunkirk didn't win more awards, I was actually very pleasantly surprised that it won for such categories as sound mixing and sound editing, and it won also for the film editing. So it was great to see Dunkirk win in those technical categories. I just kind of wish that it had been... Eh, but recognized more in the bigger categories as well. So now on to actually the acting categories. So best actress in a supporting role. The nominees were Mary J. Blige for Mudbound, Allison Janney, I, Tanya, Leslie Manville, Phantom Thread, Lori Metcalf, Lady Bird, and Octavia Spencer, The Shape of Water. I predicted that Allison Janney would win for I, Tanya. Part of me kind of wanted to see Lori Metcalf win for Lady Bird, considering she had also a very good performance. But Allison Janney, I thought, won. I'm glad I predicted her as the winner, but I also thought she deserved to win because, man, she was so great playing a woman who you think would have ice running through her veins. <laughs> but, uh, oh, man, and the way she's, she has the 
the the parent taking uh, seeds out of her ears that's just something that's too outrageous to be true but then when you actually see the footage of Tanya Harding's mother being interviewed that actually happens so I think Alice and Jenny not only turned into a performance that was not just an imitation it felt chilling and it felt real especially considering what you know about Tanya Harding's upbringing so on to the category of actor in a supporting role I don't have very much time so I'll just read you the nominees the nominees were Willem Dafoe The Florida Project Woody Harrelson Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri Richard Jenkins the Shape of Water, Christopher Plummer, All the Money in the World, and Sam Rockwell, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. So, those are the nominees. In the wake of a disaster, what one thing can you send that will help people the most? A blanket, a tent, a sandbag, a doctor. Actually, if you send a monetary donation, you send all these things. Even a small donation can make a big impact. It can quickly become exactly what people affected by disaster need most. The wake of a hurricane, a monetary donation can make a huge difference to those in need. Today, visit supporthurricanerelief.org. That's supporthurricanerelief.org. Brought to you by Gary Cancer. on film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And I correctly predicted last week that the winner of this category would be Sam Rockwell for three billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri. And I was absolutely right. I, I thought that actually, unlike most of the other categories, all the actors in the supporting category could have easily upset Sam Rockwell for various reasons. But Sam Rockwell, I think, deserved to win. And a lot of people said that maybe he didn't deserve to win because he plays a really bad cop who has a period of redemption at the end. And I'm thinking, why would that be a disqualifier for Sam Rockwell or his character not to win in, in this category? I mean, that's more of a grievance about how the movie is was written or how the character was developed rather than the actor. So Sam Rockwell deserved to win, and I'm glad he did, not only because I predicted it correctly, but moving on. Best Actress in a Leading Role. The nominees were Sally Hawkins, The Shape of Water, Frances McDormand, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, Margot Robbie, I, Tanya, Saoirse Ronan, The Lady Bird, and Meryl Streep, The Post. The winner is exactly what I predicted, Frances McDormand for Three Billboards Outside Emmy, Missouri. Sure, Sally Hawkins and Saoirse Ronan, probably more Sally Hawkins, had a chance of upsetting Frances McDormand, but I am glad that Frances McDormand won. This is her second Oscar win. She won, actually, 22 years ago, for Fargo, Best Actress in a Leading Role. And so it's great to see her win for Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. I can't tell which uh, performance of hers was was better, um, Fargo or Three Billboards, but either, I, I guess that's another list for another time. Either way, she was great in both movies. And Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, she played a really 
<laughs> a phenomenal character, and she has some great moments, especially one scene where she goes to the dentist. And if you guys have seen the movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But in, in any event, not only did Frances McDormand deserve to win, but she also had a great Oscar acceptance speech that will probably go down as the best Oscar acceptance speech of all time, or at least amongst the the women. I mean, again, that's that's another list for another time, and I'd have to go through 90 years to figure out which ones were the best or the worst or what have you, but that's another list for another time. Now on to Best Actor in a Leading Role. The nominees were Timothy Chalamet for Call Me By Your Name, Daniel Day-Lewis, Phantom Thread, Daniel Kaluuya for Get Out, Gary Oldman, Darkest Hour, and Denzel Washington for Roman J. Israel Esquire. The winner of this category was exactly what I predicted, Gary Oldman for Darkest Hour. I didn't think that either Daniel Day-Lewis or Daniel Kaluuya could have upset Gary Oldman for the win, but I'm glad to see Gary Oldman get it because, as I said, some people found Darkest Hour boring. I, I hate it when, when people say that about war films, but... Again, it, it did have a lot of politics in it, which I think might have turned people off. But in any event, Gary Oldman was probably one of the least likely actors to have played Winston Churchill. But he did a great job, not only because of the great makeup job, which was also uh, one of Darkest Hour's wins for the Oscars, and a, and a deserved one, I should say. But Gary Oldman embodied Winston Churchill, and he made me root for Winston Churchill. Not that I would root against Winston Churchill by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm just saying. So on to the category of, I'm, I'm trying to find it, it's uh, best, ah yes, best adapted screenplay. The nominees were Call Me By Your Name, The Disaster Artist, Logan, Molly's Game and Mudbound. Now, I was rooting for Molly's Game to win this one because I thought that was a, a sharp as a tack screenplay. But Call Me By Your Name won. I think Call Me By Your Name was kind of the underground favorite amongst the Academy. And while I'm disappointed that I didn't pr predict the winner, I, I do think that Call Me By Your Name certainly had its its merits to win. I think it was very much the uh, probably the favorite amongst the traditional Oscar voters. So now on to Best Original Screenplay. The nominees were The Big Sick, Get Out, Lady Bird, The Shape of Water, and Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Now, I'm really happy that Get Out won. Uh, Jordan Peele won for writing the story and the screenplay. And not only did Jordan Peele make a great acceptance speech, but also it is worthy to note that Jordan Peele said in his acceptance speech that he quit writing the screenplay to Get Out 20 times before going back to it. And I think that's an inspiration for just about any person who has ever struggled with a screenplay or maybe even a book. And I, I got to take my hat off if I was wearing a hat to Jordan Peele for not only sticking with it, but also coming out great on the other end. So, on to the category of Best Director. The nominees were Christopher Nolan, Dunkirk, Jordan Peele, Get Out, Greta Gerwig, Lady Bird, Paul Thomas Anderson, Phantom Thread, and Guillermo del Toro, The Shape of Water. So, I was rooting for Christopher Nolan for Dunkirk, because I do think that Dunkirk somehow didn't get the respect that it deserved, despite being a box office hit, especially when it came to the, the Oscar categories. I, I do think that Dunkirk somehow managed to get itself underrated over the course of the last seven months, but... Guillermo del Toro won for The Shape of Water, and I'm not disappointed that Guillermo del Toro won, because The Shape of Water was indeed a unique film. I didn't think it was a movie that would appeal to Oscar voters, but it could mean that it's a brand new day for the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, especially since over the last two years it's been devoting itself to getting 
stuck in their ways, old members who haven't been in a movie out of there and get men bringing in new talent. And I think it certainly shows with a lot of the nominees and a lot of the winners. And if this kind of... Uh, well, I, I'm not sure exactly how to finish that thought, and it's time for a break, anyhow. Oh, long time no see him. It's me, the rock t-shirt in the back of your closet. Dude, remember? You crowd surfed in me, man. But you haven't worn me in, like, forever. I get it, you're retired. But I still got some rock left in me. So take me to Goodwill, where I can really make a difference. More donations to Goodwill include jobs, training programs, and education assistance for people in your community. To find your nearest donation center, go to goodwill.org. Donate stuff. Create jobs. A message from Goodwill and the Human Council. From the hub of the solar system to the world, bostonfreeradio.com. Are you a dope beat looking for a fresh MC? Or maybe you're a fat beat in search of a flat melody. Join DJ Hodge every Wednesday from 7 to 8. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I'm just about to wrap up my recap of the Oscars, and I'm ending it with the Best Picture category. So for the Best Picture category, the nominees were Call Me By Your Name, Darkest Hour, Dunkirk, Get Out, Lady Bird, Phantom Thread, The Post, the Shape of Water, and Three Bullboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Now, the movie I was rooting for, which I incorrectly predicted would actually win, was Dunkirk. But a lot of people were rooting for The Shape of Water and Get Out, and not as many with Dunkirk. And I, I think that's too bad, but at the same time, The Shape of Water won, and I'm actually not disappointed that The Shape of Water won. After all, it, on my list of top ten movies of the year, Dunkirk was number two, um, and The Shape of Water, I think, was number four, if I'm remembering correctly. I, I wish I had brought my list with me, but either way, The Shape of Water was in the top five. I think it's a beautifully shot film, and I am glad to see that it won. I'm, I'm just a little disappointed that, that Dunkirk didn't get a lot of recognition but then again I, I think if, if The Shape of Water had won for Best Picture and Christopher Nolan had won for Best Director or if Guillermo del Toro won for Best Director and Dunkirk for Best Picture I wouldn't be disappointed but I can't speak for everyone else either so those are my Oscar recaps and now it's time to get to the really fun part of the show which is the Golden Raspberry Awards so the Oscars have been around for 90 years literally the Golden Raspberry Awards have been around for 38. So the 38th annual Golden Raspberry Awards happened the night, or rather the winners were announced on March 3rd, 2018. And unfortunately, even though the Golden Raspberry Awards were in L.A., what's really interesting is that... Um, <laughs> What's really interesting is that the, the show is still not televised. And I, I still think that, that some TV network like Comedy Central or TBS, one that specializes in comedies, should actually put a lot of production into the Golden Raspberry Awards. It's been 38 years. I would love to see this televised, or if, if not on TV, at least as YouTube videos. Because they do have a ceremony, it's just, it's very low-key, and seldom do celebrities actually show up to accept the, their awards. Some do, and have, like Halle Berry and Sandra Bullock, but a, a lot of times it would just be great to actually see people on screen actually riffing these films for all they're worth. But in any event, the worst picture, <laughs> the nominees are or were The Emoji Movie, Baywatch, Fifty Shades Darker, The Mummy, and Transformers The Last Night. 
So the winner, quote-unquote winner of this category, is the Emoji Movie, which is interesting because the Emoji Movie became the first full-length animated motion picture to receive nominations for Worst Picture, Worst Director, Worst Screen Combo, and... Uh, hang on, technical difficulty. And worst screenplay. It, it's the first full-length animated motion picture because usually animated films are pretty good. But in any event, th that's how much people hated the Emoji Movie. So, on to worst director. The nominees were Darren Aronofsky for Mother, Michael Bay for Transformers The Last Night, James Foley for Fifty Shades Darker, Tony Le Le Leandus for The Emoji Movie, and Alex Kurtzman for The Mummy. And if there's one director who should not be in this category, it's Darren Aronofsky. And as a matter of fact, the Golden Raspberry organization did actually receive backlash from audiences and critics with... Um, because of the nominations for Mother, particularly um, Jennifer Lawrence being nominated here. But in any event, that those were what the nominations were. But the winner of this category was Tony Leandis for the Emoji Movie, and I think that's pretty well deserved. I, I probably would have gone for either Michael Bay or James Foley for Transformers The Last Night or Fifty Shades Darker, respectively, because if there's one asset about the Emoji Movie, it's that it's at least its animation was pretty good, but then again, me saying that, it seems like it's giving that movie much more credit than it actually deserves. So... Worst Actor. The nominees were Tom Cruise for The Mummy, Johnny Depp for Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales, Jamie Dornan for Fifty Shades Darker, Zac Efron for Baywatch, and Mark Wahlberg for Daddy's Home 2 and Transformers The Last Night. So the winner of this category was Tom Cruise, who I very much doubt showed up to receive his award but Tom Cruise deserves this one because he was terrible in The Mummy but then again I don't like Jamie Dornan I don't think he's a very good actor he probably should have quote unquote won for Fifty Shades Darker but I have the feeling I, I have no idea what the next nine months will bring in terms of great films or terrible films but I have the feeling that Jamie Dornan is going to win next year for Fifty Shades Freed because Fifty Shades Freed was much, much worse than Fifty Shades Darker. And Fifty Shades Darker was really bad. So, on to Worst Actress. The nominees were Katherine Heigl for Unforgettable, Dakota Johnson for Fifty Shades Darker, Jennifer Lawrence for Mother, Tyler Perry, remember this is Worst Actress, for Boo 2 and Medea Halloween, and Emma Watson for The Circle. So, besides Tyler Perry, if there's one person who shouldn't be in this category, it's Jennifer Lawrence for Mother. Because, yeah, Mother was a very polarizing film, but I thought Jennifer Lawrence did well in it. And it certainly was a... a it certainly was a weird film, but I didn't think it was bad. But the winner of this category was Tyler Perry for Boo 2 and Medea Halloween. And and even though Tyler Perry's in for worst actress, he does play a woman in that movie. And not and in the movie he's not considered a man in drag, he's actually considered a woman. What in the world doing I had a stroke. I couldn't sleep. 150 over 90. And I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure sounds like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from silent. Get back on the treatment plan and talk with your doctor to create a plan that works for you. Go to www.hbp.org. Head to toe, everything has changed. You're not cheating the American Stroke Association or the Medical Association of Blood Council. I love those real sick signs. Intensify 
Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I'm running down the quote-unquote winners of the Razzie Awards, the 38th Golden Raspberry Awards. So I've mentioned the worst actor and worst actress. Now on to worst supporting actor. The nominees were Javier Bardem for Mother and Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales, Russell Crowe for The Mummy, Josh Duhamel, Duhamel as trans, uh, for Transformers The Last Night, and Anthony Hopkins for Collide and Transformers The Last Night. Now, the actor I think should have won for this category was Russell Crowe for The Mummy because, well, he was pretty bad as Dr. Jekyll. He was even worse as Edward Hyde. But Mel Gibson ended up winning for Daddy's Home 2, which I find kind of odd because I actually liked Daddy's Home 2. I thought it was funnier than the original, and I thought that both Mel Gibson and John Lithgow were funny for different reasons. But then again, people still haven't gotten over their hate for Mel Gibson, and he hasn't achieved a full comeback yet. He's achieved sort of a partial comeback from his directing career, especially after directing last year's Hacksaw Ridge. But as an actor, he still has a ways to go to make that comeback. He may make it, he may not. Either way, we'll have to see. So on to Worst Supporting Actress. The nominees were Sophia Butella for The Mummy, Laura Haddock for Transformers The Last Night, Goldie Hawn for Snatched, Susan Sarandon for A Bad Mom's Christmas, and Kim Basinger for Fifty Shades Darker. The winner of this category was Kim Basinger for Fifty Shades Darker, and I do think that is also deserved because this movie was so bad that even Oscar winners like Kim Basinger and Marsha Gay Harden couldn't even save this film. I do have to say that... Goldie Hawn for Snatched and Susan Sarandon for A Bad Mom's Christmas. I don't think they deserve to be there because I actually thought both of them were really good in those kind of bad films. And Sophia Boutella I actually thought was the best part of The Mummy. I, I didn't think there was any fault with her performance at all. I thought everything else in the movie was wrong, but not her performance. But yeah, Kim Basinger, it's, it's hard to beat her bad performance in Fifty Shades Darker. And she made the right choice by not showing up in Fifty Shades Freed. The absolute right choice. So, worst screen combo. This is an interesting category. The nominees were any two obnoxious emojis for guess which movie the emoji movie any combination of two characters two sex toys or two sexual positions 50 shades darker i love that cat i love that entry any combination of two humans two robots or two explosions transformers the last night that's not a bad combo either johnny depp and his worn out drunk routine for pirates of the caribbean dead men tell no tales and Tyler Perry in either the ratty old dress or worn out wig for Boo 2 Medea Halloween. Now, I initially thought that Tyler Perry was going to win for this category, but the emoji movie Hate Continues, not <laughs> entirely, not. Uh, I mean, not surprisingly. So the winner is any two obnoxious emojis for the emoji movie. I think that's pretty well deserved. Worst prequel, remake, ripoff, or sequel. The nominees were Baywatch, Boo 2 and Medea Halloween, Fifty Shades Darker, The Mummy, and Transformers The Last Night. The winner of this category was... Fifty Shades Darker, although I do have to say, I probably would have chosen either Boo 2 and Medea Halloween or Baywatch. For those of you who are listening to my Best and Worst of 2017 episode, I chose Baywatch as the worst movie of 2017, but I can also understand Boo 2 and Medea Halloween also made my list. Fifty Shades Darker didn't, but it was still pretty bad. But in any event, that is the quote-unquote winner for Worst Prequel rip Remake ripoff or sequel. Now on to worst screenplay. The nominees were Baywatch, and I, I won't go through all the writers because there were so many writers, Fifty Shades Darker, The Mummy, The Emoji Movie, 
and Transformers. And I gave this away earlier. The winner of this screenplay was the Emoji Movie. And the reason I think that it deserved to win this category is because... It was just, as a story, no one really cares about the social life of emojis, what they do when they're not in your text messages. And also, the story borrowed very liberally from such films, such better films, as Inside Out and Wreck-It Ralph. So, the Emoji Movie definitely deserved to win this category. And finally, the Razzie nominee, So Rotten You Loved It. I, I don't know what this means. The nominees were... Baywatch, The Emoji Movie, Fifty Shades Darker, The Mummy, and Transformers The Last Night. So the winner of this category was Baywatch, but honestly, when I saw Baywatch, I hated it. I don't know how it's so bad it's good. It was just bad. So maybe they, they ought to rethink this, this category and get some B-movies in here, like The Room, for instance. And there is one last category. Actually, there are two last categories, but I'm not exactly sure how to describe this one. This one is an achievement award called the Barry L. Bumstead Award, and it went to the movie Chips. And I'm not sure exactly who Barry L. Bumstead is, and I'm not sure why Chips of all movies got this award. I know that Chips was on a relatively big budget, but it, it bombed at the box office. I didn't even see it. But I don't know who Barry L. Bumstead is, and I'm not sure what th this has to do with it. I, I'm sure there's a place I can look it up, but I don't have time to do that since I'm on the air. But in any event... Moving on to the final category for the is the Raspberry Redeemer Award. This is usually for an actor or director who actually releases a, a good film. Like, for instance, Jennifer Aniston was nominated for Razzie's in several movies, but she got a Redeemer Award for being in the movie Cake, in which she was really good. But this year, the Raspberry Redeemer Award is, and I quote, a safe Hollywood haven where talent is protected, nourished, and allowed to flourish with proper compensation, end quote. That, that should be a Razzie Redeemer Award, especially given how much focus there was on that at the actual Oscar ceremony. So, well-worded and well-deserved. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. This breaks my heart, and it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Food Ale. Why, it's Toppers with your host again. Toppers, spinning the tune that today's youth demands. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hobie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at toppersradio, that's one word, dot blogspot, dot c o m. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've given you my recap of the Oscars and the Razzies, it's now time for my last segment of the show, which is What's Coming Up Next? These are the high-profile movies, unless otherwise specified, that are probably coming to a theater near you this coming weekend. And the biggest movie to come to a theater near you, which will definitely be coming to a theater near you, is Disney's adaptation of A Wrinkle in time and this one has been hotly anticipated because it's based on the book written by Madeline Lingle which should be required junior high reading if it isn't already I know that I read it when I was in the fifth and sixth grade and I absolutely loved the book I certainly didn't imagine the movie with characters of color in it I, I imagined them as as white characters as I'm probably sure that's how Madeline Lingle intended them to be but that's not to say that I'm, I'm against the movie adaptation having characters of color. In fact, that's something I applaud. So the movie is directed by Ava DuVernay, best known for having directed Selma. And this is the movie she actually turned down the chance to direct Black Panther 
to direct. So there's a lot of hype surrounding this movie. But we'll have to see how it is. And just for those of you who don't know what the plot of A Wrinkle in Time is, it is about a girl named Meg who, after the disappearance of her scientific father, three peculiar, three peculiar beings send Meg, her brother, and her friend to space in order to find him. The movie stars Storm Reed, who I believe is a newcomer actress. She, I don't actually have any information on how old she is, but she, nah, she's a relative newcomer. She was in 12 Years a Slave. She was in a, a movie that kind of slid under the radar last year from WWE Films called Slight, S-L-E-I-G-H-T. And she's in a couple of other upcoming films, but this is her probably breakthrough rather than her debut. The movie also stars Oprah Winfrey, Reese Witherspoon, and Mindy Kaling. There may be some other stars in there too, but those are the big ones. And this looks like it's going to be another winner for Disney after a string of hits, including those that Disney released through Marvel Studios. So A Wrinkle of Time is a movie I will definitely see when it comes out, and I will let you know what I think of the movie next week when I go back to doing my reviews. There's another movie coming out that looks like a horror movie. It's called The Strangers Pray at Night, and Pray is spelled P-R-E-Y as in preying on a victim, not P-R-A-Y as in pray before bedtime, just to give you some context. Anyway, it's a movie about a family who stays in a secluded mobile home park for the night and are visited by three masked psychopaths to test their every limit. And that sounds like a pretty good premise so far. It's directed by Johannes Roberts, and he is an English director. He was born and raised in Cambridge, and he actually directed 47 Meters Down from last summer, which I actually really liked, and that was kind of an underrated movie. Certainly a very thrilling one. So this movie, the only stars of note include Christina Hendricks, best known for playing Joan in Mad Men, and she is a not only a really good actress, she is also incredibly sexy, but <laughs> I'm just putting that out there. It also stars Bailey Madison, who's been in such movies as Bridge to Terabithia, Brothers, and Just Go With It, where he played Adam Sandler as well. <laughs> surrogate, not, not surrogate, but fake daughter. There, there's a lot to explain about that. The other actors in the movie I don't know, but that's a movie that might do pretty well. It's probably not going to do as well as A Wrinkle in Time, but considering how profitable horror movies usually are, especially those with budgets under $10 million, this one should do well. There's another movie coming out called Gringo, and this is a movie that I will definitely see. It's a dark comedy mixed with white-knuckle action and dramatic intrigue, and it explores the battle of survival for businessman Harold Soyinka, who's played by David Oyelowo, when he finds himself crossing the line from a law-abiding citizen to wanted criminal. The movie also stars Joel Edgerton, Charlize Theron, and Tandy Newton. And it's, it's kind of bizarre that David Oyelowo is the star of a movie called Gringo, because I thought Gringo referred to a non-Mexican white person. I didn't realize it referred to a non-Mexican black person as well. But either way, Gringo looks weird, and especially with David Oyelowo and Charlize Theron, not to mention Joel Edgerton, he's a fine actor too. It should be good. Hopefully it is. I'm, I'm knocking on wood here. But that's a movie I will definitely see, and I will probably review it for you for next week's show. But in any event, that wraps up this today's edition of Words on Film. Just as a reminder that the views and opinions expressed on Words on Film are solely those of your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working on the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. As another reminder, you've been listening to this show on Boston for radio.com or watching it on some real community access television or some community access t TV station those kind of to pick up this broadcast until next time I'll see you at the movies <laughs>